Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here. Welcome back to the channel. And today we are going to look at specifications of astrophotography cameras. And specifically, when you're looking to buy a dedicated astrophotography camera, you're looking at the specs and you want to be able to understand precisely what each specification actually means and how it impacts you in particular. And this video, we're going to through, go through the specifications of a sample camera. I've chosen the ASI uh, 533 MM Pro from uh, ZW just to have a look at the specifications that are listed. And we're going to go into each specification and I can explain uh, what exactly it means, how it's going to impact you, and whether it's an important specification or not. Uh, this video might last a while, so strap on, and I hope it can be a useful reference video as well for the future. I did a similar video where I focused a lot on the curves on the camera websites, but I'll cover this again in this video just to have a holistic kind of approach. I'll also put the link to that older video somewhere above so you can have a look if you're interested. So here I am on the website of my example for this video, the, the ASI 533MM Pro from ZW, and we have some marketing stuff at the top with a beautiful image. Uh, but more than that, we have a summary of the specification here and let's have a look through each of them to understand exactly what they mean and how that impacts you. The first from the top left is the sensor uh, IMX533. So this is just like the make of the sensor. This is a, a sensor from Sony. What you can do is always Google it and try to understand like what other cameras have this, uh, this sensor. You also have like data sheets that you can have a look at, but this can get quite complex and honestly, it's not really worth uh, spending too much on because this sheet actually includes other information about the sensor that is enough to understand everything there is to know about the sensor. But it's, a, it's an interesting uh, part to look at so you can compare with other cameras. Typically, other uh, astrophotography dedicated cameras, especially if they're cooled with the same sensor, will perform in a similar manner. Uh, so it's good when you're going to be looking at this particular camera, but you want to look at alternatives from other brands as well to find like the best bargain, etc. You can restrict yourself to this particular sensor if you think it fulfills your need. But otherwise, you can look at the sensor information. For instance, on the, the two next ones, we have the sensor size. Uh, the size is one inch, which is not really one inch, but forget about that. There's a big reason for that. We have the actual dimensions in millimeters, 11.31 times 11.31. And we also have the resolution of the sensor here, 3,008 pixels per 3,008 pixels. And also related to this, we have the pixel size at the bottom right, 3.76 micrometers, the side of the pixel. So what does this mean for us? So the size of the sensor itself, this 11.31 times 11.31 millimeter will determine for a specific telescope that you have, so for a specific actually focal length that you have, it will determine the uh, field of view of your camera and telescope pairing. So it's very important to be able to look at that and you can determine the field of view in tools such as astronomy tools with field of view calculator. I'll put the links uh, down below where you can put like yourself in imaging mode and you could say that, okay, my telescope has a focal length of 600 millimeters. And for the camera, maybe if it's listed, we can search for the ASI 533. And here we have the color version, but it's gonna work just as well as the monochrome version. And then you can see we have a field of view one degree per one degree. I can add it to view to show you how it looks like for this particular object. But you can also check on other websites like Telescopius, that kind of stuff to have like a more uh, holistic approach or even Nina, the software to understand more what the field of view for this sensor will be. This particular sensor, by the way, we can see it is a square sensor, uh, which I personally love because it means that rotation matter matters le much less for uh, framing of the object. So I have to care about things a bit less, but uh, a lot of people actually prefer a different sensor format. Uh, that has a proper landscape and portrait and can be rotated type of uh, type of sensor. But here, this, these dimensions tell you the field of view of your particular sensor and telescope combination. So sensor size plus focal lengths gives you the field of view. Cool. So we understand that. Then we have the resolution, which is paired, which is actually very synonymous 
with the pixel size. So if you know the sensor size and the resolution, you know the pixel size. If you know the pixel size and the resolution, you know the sensor size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you can double check it very quickly. We can open calculator, do 11.31 millimeters divided by 3008. And we have uh, 3.76. Yes, here we are 3.76 micrometers. So we can double check that all of those figures, they, they, they make sense. That's a, that's a good thing, a little uh, sanity check there. So the resolution itself, together with the pixel size tells you the size of each pixel. And each pixel, you can almost consider it as a mini sensor, right? Each pixel is there to capture some part of the sky. How much of the sky each pixel will cover is also available in this astronomy.tools uh, tool here. And you can see the resolution is 1.29 arc seconds per 1.29 arc seconds per pixel. So the lower the number here, the smaller the number, the more details the pixel can capture. I have a very involved video on just that topic as well as what we call oversampling and undersampling. So actually two videos. I'll put the links up above one after the other so you can have a look if you're interested in looking at the details. But long story short, the smaller the resolution number here, the more details you can capture. However, the smaller it is and the smaller the pixel size is, the surface area of the pixel also is much smaller, which means given a specific unit of time, the pixel will receive less light falling onto it because it has a smaller surface area. This will affect the per pixel signal to noise ratio. And in that front, the larger the pixels, the better in terms of signal to noise ratio. There's a fine balancing act, at least the per pixel signal to noise ratio. There's a fine balancing, balancing act between the resolution that you want to achieve, how much details you want to capture, and how much light you want your pixel to uh, receive. So if you're compar comparing various cameras with different sensors, the computing the actual pixel surface area rather than just the side, because then you compare the squares, will help tremendously understand the impact of the pixel size on your particular setup. So that's another area to look at. Of course, all of those are critical in your choice, but they're also fairly basic. Okay, so now we can go to the ADC, which is the analog to digital converter. And this is effectively uh, up to what number your sensor is able to count to. So to understand that number, you, you just take this uh, 14 here. Some cameras, older ones typically have 12 bits. You have newer ones that can have 16 bits. This one has 14 bits. And you can just do two to the power of 14 to understand uh, that this camera can count up to 16,384. What this means is that when the camera will read out each pixel and how many electrons a pixel has generated based on the photons that fell onto it, the camera will be able to count that uh, via a measure that we call ADUs, uh, analog to digital units. And this camera will have 16,384 ADUs available to count that. The higher number, the more precise it looks like, but this is not a number that I personally uh, look at as critical. Uh, it is linked to a lot of other things, the gain and other measures that we'll look at in the moment uh, as well. But this is not, I would say, a number to really get fixated on. The next uh, number that we have is the read noise. This read noise figure is the lowest read noise achieved by the camera, one electron, which is an excellent number. That being said, you will never use a gain with this particular camera and with most cameras that correspond to their lowest read noise. I'll go later in the video more in details about what this read noise measure actually means because it's heavily related to gain. Something that is very important to understand though is that the read noise is a price you pay with every single sub exposure. So whenever you take a single frame, read noise is added to your frame every single time. So whenever, if you're taking like 60 one second exposures, each of those one second exposures gets that one electron read noise. So we have 
that real noise getting added 60 times over compared to a single 60 second exposures, which will have only one time the read noise uh, added. And if read noise were zero, we could have uh, 60 times one second exposures be absolutely 100% equivalent to a single 60 second exposure. And this is something that a lot of beginning as photographers don't really realize that the subframe length doesn't really matter that much if you don't have any read noise, but we do and it matters. This is an important characteristic of the camera. Having a low read noise is always good. This particular sensor, as well as the 571 and the, pretty much all of the recent sensors by Sony, they have an excellent, very small read noise, which is really good. So this is a pretty important thing and uh, it, it becomes even more important if you're living or doing imaging in a dark zone, in a very dark area where there's very little light pollution. Because if you have a lot of light pollution, the read noise itself is negligible compared to the noise that's contributed by light pollution. This is my case here in Tokyo. Even with like a couple seconds of exposure time, I can ignore the read noise. But that's not the case if you're in a dark area. So this is even more important there. The next one is the cooling temperature. So this just says that the camera can cool in its sensor up to or down to minus 35 degrees Celsius below ambient. So if my ambient temperature is 35 degrees Celsius, the cooler will be able to get the sensor temperature down to zero degrees. If the ambient temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, in theory, the cooler should be able to bring the sensor temperature down to minus 25 degrees. This is very important to reduce the thermal noise that is generated by the camera sensor. And I've done in the past a comparison of a camera with cooling on and without cooling. There are also typically curves that I'll show later down in this page and in this video about how much the camera sensor temperature affects the noise of your system. So this is also a very important measurement, although from my experience, most cooled astrophotography cameras, they have similar cooling performance. That being said, uh, you can have some cameras that can suffer from fan vibrations, we can, which can be an issue with sh high focal length telescopes like schmidt cassegrain So this is definitely not part of the specifications, but something to keep in mind. The next three specifications that we have, we have the DDR3 buffer. This is basically internal memory of the camera. The camera can download the images to its internal buffer before sending the images over USB 3.0 here to your computer. Uh, so this is like, it's nice to have, but it's not something that I would focus on specifically. Most cameras these days, they have enough buffer to contain the frames that you want for deep sky astrophotography. That said, having a good buffer with USB 3 and a high frame per second kind of value is good if you're going to be doing planetary type of astrophotography, which requires high uh, frame per seconds. Uh, but with this particular camera, the main objective would typically be deep sky object astrophotography, in which case like those three things here are not that important. And that's one of the reasons why the ZW ASI Air Mini, I think is the name, uh, doesn't even have USB 3 ports because overall it doesn't really change things that much as at least for deep sky object astrophotography if you're taking long exposures something like 30 60 seconds or more which is usually the case now what about full well so the full well we can see it's 50000 electrons this is also a fairly important measure it's going to be used it's basically telling you how many electrons each pixel can contain within a sub exposure. So let's say the pixel is, is a bucket that is open to the sky, photons are falling onto the pixel, and there's a little filter at the entrance of the, the pixel that converts those photons into electrons. And those electrons, they fall into the bucket. What this 50,000 electron is saying is that in this single pixel, if we have 50,000 electrons that fall within a single sub-exposure, 
then that particular pixel will become clipped. It will become completely white and any further photon that should generate an electron will be ignored. So you're clipping or losing signal here once you're above that. Now, concretely, this will affect your dynamic range and the maximum exposure time that you can have for your sky conditions and also for the stars, because the stars are the objects that are typically the fastest to clip. And if you want nice star core colors, the larger the full well depths, the better. But full well depths is something that I'm going to go a bit more into details also slightly later in this video. Now let's look at QE. QE stands for quantum efficiency. It's basically the probability for a given pixel when the pixel receives a photon, at what probability will the pixel convert this photon to an electron that can be read out? Because the way that it works is photons fall into the pixels. The pixels, there's this little filter at the top it's not like that, but whatever. It does this little filter that converts uh, photons to electrons, and then the, the electrons are gathered in the bucket at the end of each sub-exposure. This bucket, the electrons from the bucket will be read out with the read noise added when that happens. This result will be stored in your raw file that you download, and the bucket is empty again. So if you have an electron that falls with this particular QE quantum efficiency of 91%, there's a 91% probability that it's going to be converted into an electron, electron that will be counted. There is a 9% chance that uh, the photon won't even be counted. So you're losing data, you're losing signal uh, in that case. But still, 91% is pretty good. But as you can see, it's 91% at 460 nanometers, which is not like a wavelength of light that we care that much about in astrophotography. Uh, so this is another thing where it's a curve and it's down below in the page. So we'll have a look at exactly what that curve is in more details. Okay, so that's like kind of this summary here. It can, kind of gives you like the best case, like it gives you some really good specifications and for things like the quantum efficiency and the read noise, it gives you the best case stuff but those figures here are not that relevant. What's relevant is what those figures will be for the wavelengths that we're interested in. And for the read noise, it will be for the gain that we will be using. Okay, now we have some description of things, but we get to the curves that, uh, that are what I think the most interesting part of all of this. So let's start actually with the quantum efficiency because this is the easiest to understand. The x-axis has the wavelengths of light. The more you are on the left, the bluer things are. So we have the blue and deep blue here. We have the green basically uh, around here, I guess. Yeah, green around here. And then we have the red around here. And then on the right, we have the infrared. For nebula imaging, some of the very important parts are around 500 nanometers of wavelengths. That's blue-green kind of color. And you can see that for that, we have 90% quantum efficiency. This is great because many nebulae, they emit oxygen-3, which is at this particular wavelength mostly. So we get great quantum efficiency there. If we're looking around uh, 650 or six, uh, yeah, 657, if I remember correctly, we have the wavelengths of H-alpha. And that's a very strong signal and uh, in most nebulae. And you can see we get like something like 57, 58%, which is decent without being great. But then H-alpha is so strong that it doesn't really impact us that much. But then when we get to 672, roughly, we get down to 50%. This is the wavelength of sulfur 2. Uh, it's another thing that we like to use for nebulae. And it's pretty faint. So it's a bit of a bummer to see that for sulfur 2, this particular sensor has just around 50%, slightly above 50% of quantum efficiency, which means that if a deep red photon uh, basically falls onto a pixel, there's only a chance of 50% that it will be converted into an electron and therefore be counted by your camera when it generates the raw, raw frame based on the readout of your pixels at the end of a sub-exposure. That said, pretty much all cameras 
uh, and all sensor, they have a similar curve. And this particular curve for the 533 uh, sensor, as well as 571, and all of those newest red generation sensors, they're all very similar. And this is really a really good curve in the first place. Some cameras have better quantum efficiency in the infrared region here. Uh, on the right hand side above 700 basically, which can be good if you're going to be using infrared uh, for things like uh, galaxies and, and going looking through into the galaxy details because infrared is much less affected by light pollution. But this gives you a good idea of how efficiently the camera will be able to count photons by first converting them into electrons uh, via this curve. So you can compare various cameras based on their quantum efficiency, if you know that you're doing a lot of narrowband imaging, you'll be able to look at the wavelengths that are interesting to you and compare it across the various cameras. This is a very important figure and a very important curve. I also see that we have zero amp glow here. So amp glow is um, uh, something that affects both your light frame and your dark frames. It's kind of this starburst pattern typically that appears you can correct it with dark frames, but it's usually a pain to deal with. It's much better, much better to have a camera without any amp glow, like we see on the right hand side, and which this camera is. Pretty much all of the newest sensors uh, have no amp glow, which makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, if you don't have any amp glow, and especially if your camera is cooled, uh, usually it makes sense to not even do any dark frames. You can limit yourself to just bias frames and flat frames for calibration. Okay, but let's go back to our curves here. Okay, so all of those curves here, we have the full well in electrons, the well depth. We have the gain in electrons per ADU. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. We have the dynamic range in stops. And we have the read noise in electrons. And on the x-axis for all of those four graphs, we have the gain. And this is the number that you can put in the gain for your camera in the camera settings. And uh, we can start with the read noise. The read noise, as I was mentioning earlier, typically, the smaller the read noise, the better, especially if you're going to take short sub exposures. For a camera like this one, the 533 uh, MM Cool or MM Pro, uh, you can see that you have a, a, a big drop of uh, read noise at gain 100. And then the, the read noise will lower very slowly up to gain like 450. What you can also notice is as the gain increases, you're losing full well depth and you're also losing dynamic range, which basically tells you how much of faint details you can get together with very bright. Obviously, losing dynamic range is not a good thing. And so when you put for this particular camera, if you increase your gain above 100, you get very marginal improvements in read noise at the cost of a really large drop of dynamic range, which really isn't worth it. Uh, so I personally wouldn't do that. This particular camera, like 99% of the time and 99% of the cases, there's a very clear argument to say that you want to just use it at gain 100 all the time, because then you get a dynamic range that is almost the same as, uh, as at gain zero, and you'd still get a pretty good full well depth. The read noise itself, I already mentioned what it means. It's basically, as I was saying, like the noise that is added to your image every time you read a subframe. So whenever the camera, like, okay, you're, you've taken an exposure, each pixel has stored electrons, and those electrons, they need to be read out by the camera before being given to, given to you as a raw frame. When the camera reads out those electrons, it will have some measuring error effectively. That's the read noise. This And the read noise, really, it's statistically, just like any other noise measurement, it's a standard deviation. So like one pixel, when you measure it, we might add randomly 1.5 electrons to it, remove 1.5 electrons, maybe add one or minus one, or maybe sometimes it could be two or three electrons added or removed, but at a much lower probability. So this is like when you read out the frames, what is the measurement error that you have? This is the read noise and it is very important uh, for your imaging. The read noise will basically determine 
for your sky condition, your telescope, and your camera, uh, how long at least each of your sub exposure would be. So if you're wanting to take many short exposures to try and do like almost like lucky imaging for deep sky astrophotography, this figure is super, super important. Okay, so we know what the read noise is versus the gain, but what exactly does the gain mean? One thing that is very important to understand with those cameras and any camera, including your DSLR with ISO, which is synonymous to some extent, the gain setting that we have here for this astrophotography camera, gain does not make your camera more sensitive to light. Gain only changes how your camera counts electrons. And this is signified by this curve here, the purple pinkish curve here, which is the electrons per ADU. Remember when I talked about the ADC being 14 bits and we computed and said like, okay, this camera is able to count up to 16,384. These are ADUs. So the camera has 16,384 ADUs available to count electrons. So when it's converting the number of electrons that you have in your pixels, to a digital value, it will use a number between 0 and 1600, uh, 16,383. And it's just a mapping from your well depths really to ADUs. And here you can see the gain per ADU. What this tells us is that at gain 100, we are saying that one electron counted will be one ADU. Strictly speaking, this means that because the camera can only count up to 16,384, when you have a gain of 100, your full well depth has to also be 16,384 uh, because we cannot count more electrons than that. The camera is doesn't know how to count higher than that because it is a 14-bit ADC camera. And we can confirm that on the full well kind of graph here. If we look for gain 100, we can see that the full well, we have 10K here. This is a logarithmic scale. Uh, so here, this dot here is 20K. We have something that is in between 10K and 20K and closer to 20K. This is actually 16,000. So everything is like consistent between those charts. It's always good to be able to confirm that. By contrast, if you look at gain zero, you can see that you need you have three electrons per ADU, which means that if the camera uh, looks at a pixel and sees that a pixel has stored three electrons, it will count it as one ADU. If it sees that the pixel has stored uh, 300 electrons, it will count it as 100 ADU. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And it also brings us to something else, which is, uh, from my understanding, what we call the quantization error, which is, okay, what if the camera counted four electrons? Okay, it's definitely one ADU. What about the fourth electron? Does it get rounded down to one ADU? Or do we round up to two ADU? Or do we just truncate that electron and forget that it ever existed? That happens. So. You basically, when you're below the unity unity gain in your subframes, you could be ignoring electrons that you stored in your pixels simply because they didn't reach the next ADU level. Something to keep in mind. Some cameras don't even have what we call a unity gain. The unity gain is just like the gain for which you have one electron per ADU. If we look at a different camera, I'm currently using at the looking at the ASI. 2600mm Pro, you can see that the uh, the gain figure, the lowest gain gives us 0 0.75 electrons per ADU. So we never need to have multiple electrons per ADU. One of the reasons for that is that this particular camera is a 16-bit ADC camera, so it can count to over 65,000 ADUs, which makes having to need multiple electrons per ADU, much less relevant than for a camera, the 533, that can only count up to uh, 16,384. Uh, by the way, okay, we know that the camera can uh, count up to 16,384 ADUs. And if we have three electrons, or maybe slightly higher, maybe 3.1 electron per ADU at gain zero, let's try to see like, how many electrons per pixel the camera can count before it clips. 
before it saturates. So that would be uh, 3.1 times 16,384. This is roughly 50,000. And remind me, what is the full well of the camera? It's 50,000. So there you go. You can see those curves are linked together. Everything makes sense. Your uh, ADC here, 14 bits, is linked to your gain electrons per ADU, which itself is linked to the full well depths. Everything is interconnected. I love when things just make sense. And I hope that it helps you realize as how all of those figures very often they're synonymous to another. You can de derive one from the other. What about dynamic range in stops? Uh, so dynamic range is a term used by photographers. I'm not a photographer and this is a term that I don't really understand that much. I kind of like just go by the uh, rule of thumb that the higher the number, the better, the more. <laughs> basically, it's just like I can have more spacing or I have I can basically capture uh, fainter objects while at the same time capture a brighter object without saturating, saturating the bright object nor losing the faint object in, in, in noise. It's basically the difference between the noise floor and the maximum amount that the sensor can measure before it saturates. So let's have a look at how that could potentially work. We know that at gain 100 for this camera, we have a gain of uh, 16,000, we have a gain, sorry, of one electron per ADU. We know we have 16,384 ADUs, therefore the full well depth is 16,384. We also know that our read noise is 1.5. Let's take our well depths. So 16,384, the maximum amount of electrons we can store and count per pixel and divide it by the read noise, the basically the floor of the signal that I can measure. Anything lower than that will be lost, indistinguishable from the read noise floor eff effectively. So let's do this. We can see that 16,384 divided by 1.5 is roughly 11,000. Okay, but 11,000 doesn't appear anywhere in here. But stops, they're counted as powers of two. We can see that for gain 100, we have roughly 13.5 stops according to this chart. So let's do something interesting. Let's do two to the power 13.5 and see what happens. And you can see the number it gives us is 11,584, which is very close to the number that we computed here. It's actually exactly the same. It's just that the charts here are not precise enough to, to for me to be able to get, get the exact numbers. But here you go. You can see that the dynamic range can be deduced from the read noise and the full well. Also, the full well can be deduced from the gain and the ADC precision here. Everything can be deduced from an, one another and really the core of everything is going to be your read noise, your gain, and the number of ADUs that you have available. Then you can deduce everything from that. Hopefully I haven't lost you because this is really like interesting stuff about how, how all of those curves are related to one another. And as I was saying, read noise is super important. Dynamic range is super important. Full well is super important. And all of those are all the more important that you are in a dark zone with little light pollution. The full well actually is also quite important if you're in a very light polluted area because the sky glow can saturate your sensor extremely quickly. And you want to avoid that by limiting yourself to short exposures. Now let's talk a little bit about cooling. We already saw that this camera can cool the sensor to 35 degrees Celsius below ambient. This is great. What does that actually mean, concretely speaking? Here we have the curve of the dark current in electrons per second per pixel compared to the x-axis, which is the sensor temperature. So if your sensor is at minus five degrees Celsius, every second you have a dark current noise, thermal noise added to each of your pixels whose uh, standard deviation is 0 0.00098 electrons. 
So let's take an example. I've taken a subframes of 300 seconds long. So five minutes subframe. My sensor was at minus five degrees Celsius. How much noise did that add to my frame? Well, it's simple. I can open a calculator and we can see 300 seconds times uh, 0 0.00098. That's roughly the amount of noise that we added. This is 0 0.294. Okay, so we could see that with our sensor at minus five degrees Celsius and our 300 second long sub exposure, we have a thermal noise of 0 0.3 three electrons. How does that compare to the 1.5 uh, electrons of read noise that we have at gain 100? Well, to compare them to actually see what the total noise is with the thermal noise plus that read noise, and I'm not considering sky glow at all at this stage, uh, we can simply add the squares and then take the square root. So I'm just going to say that this is 0 0.3. So what I would do is just like 1.5 squared, so this is the read noise contribution, plus 0 0.3 uh, squared, okay? So that's like the, uh, the, the two sources of noise added, and we are going to take the square root of that. And we can see that in the end, adding those two, it gives us 1.53, roughly. So pretty much the same as the read noise, almost no change from the read noise. So we can see that with our sensor at minus five degrees, the contribution of the thermal noise for a long exposure of 300 seconds has added, it's like completely insignificant compared to the read noise, which is a very interesting thing to look at because this tells us that there is almost no merit to cooling the sensor even more than that. You can, but you don't have to, which is really good and it's a comforting thought, especially if it's the, the dead of summer and the nights are really, really, really warm and you are not able to cool your sensor a lot. So this is a curve that you can use. It's a very useful curve to try and understand like how much you should cool your sensor and at what point cooling your sensor just doesn't really make sense anymore. Because in our particular case, we could see for my 300 second exposure, the, uh, the read noise was completely overwhelming the thermal noise. So based on those specifications, is this camera good? Well, of course it's good. Pretty much all of the new generation sensor-based cameras are excellent. You really can't go wrong. The, the real differentiator that you can see will be the various readout modes that the cameras provide. Sometimes too much can actually be a bit overwhelming. Uh, so some makers actually try to keep it simple. Other makers, they give you a lot of control on tons of parameters that even I have trouble understanding. So that's one difference between makers for the same sensor. You could also have like the cooling system, how likely the camera could form like ice crystals within the sensor if it's cooled too aggressively, uh, that kind of stuff. So it's like all in the details and those things that differentiate the different camera makers. They're not in the specifications, they're in reviews, they're in user feedback, they're in videos like mine and others as well. So it's very important to consider that as well. So what camera are you looking at if you're wanting to purchase something? Will those tips and explanations that I provided be useful to you guys? Sorry about this very, very long video. So congratulations if you made it to this point. I also want to give a huge thank you to all of my viewers, subscribers, because you make the channel possible. But even more than that, my Patreon supporters and channel members support me financially. It makes a huge, huge difference. It helps me keep the channel moving. And it to help me cover the costs of making all of those videos. So thank you so, so much. If you're interested in joining my Patreon and in some ranks have early access without ads to my videos, the links are down in the description. If you're interested in buying a new astrophotography camera, you may want to click on one of my links down in the description before navigating to the camera that you're interested in. Even doing that will help me. Uh, tons of ways to help. Of course, don't forget forget to like the video, leave a comment as well. Any interaction with the video helps expand its reach and reach is the most important thing on YouTube. At any rate, please leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know what camera you're wanting to buy. Let me know if I made any mistakes. And uh, more than that, 
uh, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.